Let's talk about the coastal imaginary, how we conceptualize our coast. Eventually, we'll talk about the measurement uh, of the area that we call the coast and what falls within the official definition of the coast. But let's start this conversation by just conceptually thinking about ideas of the coast. So therefore, when we say the coast, what do we mean by that? What comes to mind? What, what elements are there in this, in this idea? Uh, firstly, the coast is really an interface, a betwixt between. The classic is, as you see here, this lady striding the, um, the surge line. Um, the classic is the immediate area where the water is going to touch the land. But um, there's, there's, that interface can take on many forms. And so uh, on this cover of Alta Journal, um, you know, you can see the, the implication is that stuff happens, not just at the water line, but other stuff happens. There's the, the bleak, empty <laughs> uh, a terrestrial landscape. It's not all bleak. It's not all empty. But, but, um, but really things happen at this transition space. Perhaps the most dramatic example of a transition space in the coast, the interface of the coast, is the intertidal. And so here we see an example from up by Summerland, but we see going from the left, the dry terrestrial boulders, sand, um, not that much life, clearly conspicuous macroscopic life. And then as we start to go to the right, um, we get more algae, we get more um, crabs, uh, mussels, things of that nature. So, so interface is a key aspect of the coast. Next, the coast tends to be very dynamic. Now, these are some, some uh, extreme examples, but this would be um, the, uh, as the tsunami was coming on shore uh, in Indonesia in 2004, obviously tremendous uh, uh, power and, and tremendous movement of water. Same thing here in Japan in 2011 with the um, uh, Japanese earthquake and the um, subsequent tsunami. We're looking at the water overtopping the the concrete wall which is underneath that that curl of water um, the entire ocean has risen up um, and is beginning to cause the horrendous flooding in Japan at this time again dynamic nature things change a lot at the coast next the coast is quite productive so um, as far as our natural areas around the earth um, the coasts on average are the most productive that we have now, <clears throat> we measure productivity in different measures. The most productive um, in terms of biomass accumulating uh, area on Earth are um, agricultural settings where we have a lot of fertilizers, specifically sugarcane. So sugarcane is the most productive, the most biomass per unit area per day. Um, but the coast is also really productive. You see these, these flock of gulls, for example, <clears throat> near Leo Carrillo, um, highly abundant. And perhaps the most the, the classic example here would be giant kelp macrocystis reefs. So we have some uh, individuals of mac macrocystis in some parts of the ocean that um, are on the uh, deeper than 367 meters, and that individual alga is is attached to the bottom at at more than 300 meters and growing all the way to the surface of the ocean. Now, um, and, and so so. One of the reasons we have the fantastic productivity and diversity, in particular, that we do in our um, along our coast, it are these these networks, these necklaces of kelp reefs that uh, surround our waters. So recall, um, th this is not a, a plant per se. This is not a uh, angiosperm, um, but it is um, protist, but it is. Um, uh, ha has uh, very similar structures grossly uh, to those um, trees and plants we're more familiar with. So in this case, we have this, a stipe, the thing that's coming up that we m maybe would think of as the, the trunk or the stem kind of thing. And then instead of having leaves, we have fronds. And while the uh, maybe a typical plant that we're looking at, if we look at, say, our, our hand as a leaf, um, the meristematic region, the growing area, would be oftentimes around the edge of the leaf on a terrestrial plant, so it gets bigger and bigger. Your hand, by analogy, gets bigger and bigger. Here, with these critters, um, uh, the apical meristem, the actively dividing uh, area, is right at the base, and so it's essentially a conveyor belt. Each of the fronds is a conveyor belt. And if you go out there under the ideal conditions, which is basically now, not this time of year, and we put a hole punch uh, near the base of that, um, that frond, 
so that we cut out a little hole so we can conspicuously see where that hole is and how far it is from the, from the stipe or from the mat assist. Um, uh, and then come back 24 hours later, oftentimes that, that hole punch will have moved one foot. So we'd see one foot of growth of this frond. And that's on one frond, which is one of hundreds or thousands on that one stipe or that one part of the stipe. And there are you know, dozens of these stipes. So this is an incredibly productive um, uh, critter. And then just one final note about this productivity in the coastal zone. Um, we conceptualize seasons uh, with uh, our traditional uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, our coastal Southern California seasons really are pretty, are, <laughs> other than fire, flood, mud season <laughs> and uh, that we seem to have these days, um, uh, the seasons are really dictated by the life cycle of giant kelp and associated with this productivity. So this time of the year is the big giant canopy. So now these, these individuals have grown so large that they're laying down on the surface. So late summer, early fall is the time of massive kelp canopies on the surface. All of that biomass, all that productivity, not only creates habitat and, and, and food directly for the critters that live on that uh, in these reefs, but also the sloughing off, the, the breaking off of that tissue goes into the detrital food web um, or rack on beaches, rack, W-R-A-C-K, on beaches. And, and that exported biomass um, augments all kinds of communities, both underwater and uh, on land. So the coast, very productive. Here's an example uh, from Malibu, um, talking about uh, fisheries. It's the end of November. It's November of 2018. And what we see here, looking just off the coast of Malibu, we're just about at your, the bottom of Yerba Buena Road here on the edge of PCH. And we see this very large squid fleet. So our most, uh, in terms of the number of individuals harvested, in terms of the gross poundage of seafood landed in California, our squid fishery is number one or, or always close to number one for the past many years. So these guys are going out in these boats that have these very large lights. And that's what we're seeing right here at sunset. So they've activated these lights. The squid are phototactic, so they're going to swim towards the light. So the squid are attracted to these lights. So the, these, these lights are essentially mimicking the moon. Uh, and uh, these guys are going to deploy hooks and they're going to capture the squid. In this case, mostly we're talking Lalago market squid. And there's some deep, uh, deep, deep canyons, deep ravines right here off of this section of Malibu, sort of the northwestern section um, of the Malibu coast. And these guys love to park off here. Um, there are great squidding grounds off of Catalina and elsewhere, but this is one of the, in recent years in particular, the most sort of tried and true places where these squid boats can come in and get catch at this time of year. Right now we have some wonderful sunsets uh, thanks to the Hill and Woolsey fires. They're still actively burning behind us on the hills, but that hasn't stopped the squid, hasn't stopped the fishing effort, hasn't stopped California's ravenous appetite for squid. Now if we can only figure out how to actually process and prep this squid here in California as opposed to shipping it across to China to be processed and then shipped back for us for eating, uh, we'll be all set. Everybody should go out and have some wonderful calamari, a relatively sustainable harvest here off the California coast, in this case off of the Malibu coast in Southern California. So seafood and, and that, that, that productivity that nourishes us is another key part of the, um, of the coast. Um, next, another uh, a frequent dimension of uh, the coast and our conceptualization, conceptualization of the coast is that heterogeneity that, that is so classic. So um, here we're talking about abiotic heterogeneity, the weather. And so this is a recent, this is a grab of... Um, of uh, um, weather conditions doesn't matter what it is, right? It doesn't matter if it's hot or or, or uh, heat or um, rainfall or whatever. But there is definitely this this coastal lens, this coastal fringe, um, where things are different and oftentimes more variable. 
we see that also with vegetation, for example. This is a uh, from the water to the land cross section. What we see is we see representative different types of um, vegetation depending on where we are relative uh, uh, to um, water, for example, in the coastal zone. And so that induces different um, ecological communities in different locations. And then finally, uh, just the, the overall geometry. Um, so this is not to say that uh, forests are boring or, or deserts are plain or anything of that nature, but, but a unique geometry that has unique implications for our management in the coastal zone uh, has to do with the fact that the coast is a linear phenomenon, right? So, so the immediate coast, the, the shoreline is a linear phenomenon and everything is concentrated on that. So here I'm illustrating that with some productivity that you can see the, the sort of bright green, the greenness in the water. Um, and what that's going to do is that's going to take you and I movers about on the surface of the earth that can go in any, any which way direction. We can go up, down, east, west, whatever. Um, uh, and really we're constrained um, uh, to, when we talk about coastal resources, really constrained to this relatively narrow band. Indeed, if we're talking something like the intertidal, it's literally a line. Um, so, so the fact that everything is piled on top of each other, everything piles up on this coastal line um, is one of the reasons we have so many conflicts and so many challenges and struggles. Um, next, I would argue that the coast is, is not just because we live here at the coast, not just because we're interested in the coast, but that the coast looms large in our species um, in our in our culture's conceptualizations um, uh, and, and continues to exert a disproportional influence upon how we think about ourselves individually and our, our broader society. Um, so uh, this is one uh, brief example, um, uh, I'll, the full video uh, I'll link to below, but um, this is an example from um, Prohibition. Now Prohibition, uh, a couple things here to highlight real quick before I play this. Um, uh, first, they'll talk about the coastline. The, co the first number of 5,000 miles is, is if we just did a really quick, quick and dirty, you know, uh, a very gross um, estimate of the coast. The 35,000 mile coastline of the lower 48s is if we took every embayment and all the true um, variability and true um, uh, uh, complexity of the coastline in there. So we have a very large coastline. Next. Um, this is this video here is talking about the prohibition era era excuse me so the uh, early 1900s um, very few vessels surprisingly very few patrol bet vessels last thing um, by, by way of context here is um, that they'll talk about um, the US waters at this time US territorial waters only went out to three nautical miles not not a mile but three nautical miles close to a mile but not not the same thing um, and that was driven by the fact that, um, we could only claim our, as our territory, that which we could defend from the land. So three miles was ba essentially the distance that are the best giant cannon, you know, biggest honkinest cannon that could shoot, um, could strike a target off to sea. So at the time that was a three nautical mile uh, limit. After World War II, the U.S. will lead the effort to establish the, the modern standard, which is essentially 200 nautical miles from uh, from the coastline. Um, uh, and uh, turns out, and, and we also push the the Convention of the Law of the Sea. We are not a signatory of the Convention of the Law of the Sea, but more on that later. Um, but uh, but so so the, this here, the, this video, this brief video is in the um, early 1920s, and it's about prohibition. And that, 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 I have a link to that video you guys can watch. Um, if I include it, sometimes it, it tend, YouTube tends to block my videos. So, um, okay, so other issues, just conceptualizing and, and examples of, of struggles that, that, that we face um, in the sea that have to do with our conceptualizations, or at least partly to do with our conceptualizations. That idea that we just mentioned um, of the, <clears throat> um, the, the, 200 nautical miles, the, the, the territorial area extending from our terrestrial 
holding is what's going on in at least seven islands in the South China Sea where China is, is attempting to exert its influence. So for the last many years, China has gone on to areas that are essentially a little teeny tiny sand spit or um, not, even, not even a sand spit, just a, a submerged coral reef and then actively pumped sand. So first and foremost, they've been destroying the reefs and, and all that because they don't really care about that kind of stuff. But anyway, but so, so they're, they're infilling these areas, creating islands, and then putting military bases on here. And what, you, what the ostensible reason here is for fishing activity, really they don't care about the fishing activity. That's just a front. Really what they're doing is putting in military bases. And these military bases are then used to project hard power and claim additional territories. So, so China is trying to necklace the South China Sea with these um, de novo islands and then claim this is our territory. Now our waters extend out to you know, X distance. So um, the struggles with this, the struggles with um, competing superpowers and things of that nature um, is, is, is a real dimension here in the coastal zone. Another aspect, because so much of, of the ocean is, uh, you know, the vast majority of it, it's a three-dimensional structure, so it's below the surface. Um, that's led to a lot of things that because we don't directly see, we think of as being um, not a problem. And so out of sight, out of mind. And so so dumping of pollutants, um, over harvesting, or in the case as illustrated here, the the leaving of, of fishing detritus that goes on to kill uh, unintended things, so-called bycatch, um, is is a huge problem and that's driven by the conceptualization of the ocean as vast and infinite and something that neither you you nor I could possibly impact. Um, we're seeing a lot of stress in these situations in our in our coastal and marine sit settings. Um, and so perhaps one of the greatest examples of this is the Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest biogenic structure on Earth, um, easily seen from space. Um, that fantastic um, heritage of all of ours that is uh, on the northern side of Australia um, is basically dying. And so um, it's, it's, it's going through a, a series of bleaching events um, caused by various things, various stressors, but, but most conspicuously here, um, uh, climate change and increased water temperature, changed sediment regimes, um, and uh, uh, changed ocean acidification that are impacting all these calcareous critters and all these uh, coralline um, backbones. We mentioned earlier the fantastic productivity in our area driven by giant kelp and a lot of these tropical systems. Um, it is uh, the backbone of the reef system, the, the real productivity driver um, are these coral, these reef building corals. And so the current estimates are we might be losing the Great Barrier Reef by as soon as 2050, which is crazy for a structure that's been there for millions of years. Um, another one is this idea of a, a, a permanence and all that kind of stuff, right? So th these conceptual ideas of the coast, um, we think of something is here, so it's going to keep being here. We forget the dynamic nature. We forget the interface nature. And so this is a... a Animation this is a visualization of um, this this area in Miami, where um, essentially we have sunny day flooding. So not during a hurricane, not during a, a, a yearly high tide or something like that, but rather just regular old um, rise of the tide on any, any given day. And that is continuing to um, be a greater and greater problem. It is unlikely that the city of Miami will persist. Um, much. Now, is it going to die tomorrow? No. Is it going to die two weeks from now? No. But um, if I live a nice, healthy life, it is unlikely that my, the city of Miami will exist um, um, in the location it is as it is now um, when I am, uh, you know, when I'm when I'm 75 or or 90 years old or something like that nature. Um, and so, more about that later. But basically, um, uh, this this uh, idea that there really are consequences, right? And not understanding the coast and the coastal dynamics um, are, is, is quite a, a folly to be engaged with. Um, and that's not just a folly in places like Miami, it's a, it's a um, folly all around the world. So here we're looking at Venice, the great city of Venice, um, that w the structures you see people walk on were built hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and now these things are flooding. So now, um, during uh, high tides, you either have to have these little disposable galoshes that you get at a store, or walk around on these raised platforms. And um, 
the response um, of the Italians is to essentially um, cordon off the lagoon where Venice is located, the coastal lagoon, um, during times of, of high water. And so essentially have a, a mechanical gate that will close and hold back the water either during very high tides or during um, a big storm event type of thing and then can open up for the rest of the year. So that's, that's a crazy engineering solution. We can't do that. I mean, maybe we can do that for the Venices of the world, but for the vast majority of the, our coastal resources, we cannot engineer our way out of this. Next, I just want to mention that um, the coastal zone is also full of special interests as, as any you know, true uh, hard management challenge uh, seems to be. Um, and also there's lots of powerful forces. But in particular, I want to uh, now mention a little bit about the visual rhetoric and, and how important that has been to our conceptualization of the coast. And so on the left, we have President Trump who thought he could... Uh, you know, go to uh, a, a hurricane damaged area and, and fling a couple paper towels and, and have an impact um, and is portrayed as a, a pirate. People people get the idea when we talk about a pirate, people get the idea what we're talking about. On the right, this is um, uh, this is not the pandemic. This is um, this is pre pandemic, but this is then uh, Governor Christie of New Jersey um, because of a budgetary uh, uh, uh discussion, argument, debate, um, uh, shut down the New Jersey beaches, many of the New Jersey beaches because of um, uh, uh, personnel reasons, essentially. But even though it was closed to the rest of the public, uh, famously, he and his family would went out and, and, and hung out on the beach. So so this idea of the beach is a lazy place, the beach of this is a place where folks that um, you don't, don't, don't do work kind of go and hang out. Like th These are powerful... Um, um, rhetorical tools and things that are deeply embedded in our conceptualization. So much so that many of our political cartoonists and, and others will draw upon this imagery all the time. In fact, so often we often don't even really get it. But, but this is an example from the then uh, chief, uh, the then head of the EPA who was um, super problematic and, uh, and later prosecuted. But the point is, um, hey, here's a challenge. And the, um, the illustration, the political illustration is, let's show a coastal flood and someone having to escape on a boat. Um, we, the, the terminology, also the phrasing, the wording is also in all of our language. So for example, no day at the beach, um, uh, all kinds of other phrases, no port in a storm, a sea change, a rough seas ahead, trolling from, from folks that are looking for fish, um, all these types of phrases, the tide is turning, um, all this stuff is it comes from our coastal and marine heritage and is really really salt and peppered across our uh, daily lives um and and also uh the notion of 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 threat right so here one for president obama one for president uh, trump but you see the same basic idea which is um, how do we visualize a big dangerous thing well, it's a tidal wave, right? It's a big giant wave that comes in from the ocean and strikes you as you're hanging out on the beach in your chairs. And so, so these, this imagery repeated over and over and over again. And so that's really important. So therefore, we need to really understand our, um, understand this, this image, right? And, and, and be able to uh, interpret this. And this last one here, this is another example of a, of a marooned vessel, right? We all get the idea. So if somebody's being thrown overboard, we get the idea. Stuck on a deserted beach somewhere, we get the idea. Um, and so let's continue that uh, analysis. So uh, we, we will do a brief um, analysis of some different classical paintings and, and more contemporary paintings, um, just to sort of get our, our juices flowing before our, our activity. So we'll start just by staring at the screen. <laughs> and hopefully, as you stare at the screen, you see things uh, move move uh, a little bit. So there's all kinds of visual tricks we can play. And artists oftentimes will um, specifically employ different symbolism or different um, uh, visual tools to induce different feelings. Uh, not necessarily the queasy feeling you might be feeling looking at this, uh, this supposedly moving um, field of the stagnant image. Um, but nevertheless, uh, all kinds of great things. So we can talk about exploring the details. The first example we'll talk about is St. Sebastian. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, this is one of three um, classic versions um, painted by Mantegna in the late 1400s. 
Um, but suffice it to say, there's all kinds of fantastic detail here. And what I'm asking you to do in these exercises that, exercises that we'll do in class is to look at the visual rhetoric. So what is the stuff going on here? What, what are the elements? Or what is the artist trying to convey? What's the message here, right? So we can talk about the detail, um, the, the, the upper part of this image, since it's very detailed and it's very um, um, long, uh, it's hard to get it all in, but, but just you can take a quick glance here at this um, top part of the image and then this bottom part of the image. So so like for you guys to think about this, what are all the different things being communicated or implied in this image? Next, let's talk about the overall impression. So for that, let's take a look at this uh, image from the mid 1800s, the, just the very start of the Industrial Revolution in France. And so, um, so this is more of an impressionistic land, landscape, but I'll have you guys stare at this and see what, what's going on here. You know, what, what's the message? What, what, what's the story being um, uh, implied by this painting? And then next, uh, you know, really talking about details. Let's get let's get into some of those those specific things that are implied with the the, the particular given uh, visual um, item. Classic painting. Uh, you guys have talked about this in the National Park and other other courses. Cons Bio probably um, environmental history. Uh, so this is uh, you know probably the 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 most classical image of American expansionism into the West. Um, this American progress by Gast um, really is coming out at the time when um, uh, you know we are we've we've gone full bore uh, into the West and manifest destiny. That phrase from that uh, um, op-ed in a Colorado newspaper really was taken as um, uh, the marching orders for for justification for many many folks. And so so obviously here um, uh, American progress as visualized by this saintly, godly um, uh, a woman who's going from the east to the west, uh, driving out uh, nature, Native Americans, um, etc., bringing civilization, uh, domestication, uh, etc. So all, we, we could spend a whole class just talking about this one uh, individual uh, image. And then... Um, some you know much of our visual rhetoric not all but much of our visual rhetoric has a, a particular message implied with it and i think that's really illustrated well by this recent um uh installation piece in this case this is uh the, the, this um sculpture has been moved around different places and uh, photoshopped in different places um this is an example <clears throat> of an iteration as of uh, 2021 um, and this is, yeah, so I'll let you guys stare at this and see if you can interpret the message here. Okay, and then um, we can just sort of talk about the overall rhetoric. We can pull all this stuff together, the specifics. We can talk about specific examples, the overall impression, um, etc. And so we'll end with looking at a couple uh, last um, contemporary pieces of art by George Sumner, the, the marine artist, uh, the, the environmental impressionistic artist, as he likes to describe himself, uh, artist George Sumner. And so uh, for this one, have a look at this. What's, you know, what's going on here in this image? What, what, what are the things that you see? What are the details you see? And then what's the overall feeling? What do you think the message is? What's, what's the takeaway? And then lastly, uh, we'll finish with another of uh, George Sumner's pieces. This is a Playland at the Beach. Um, and so this, uh, another example of a, of a San Francisco coastline. Have a look, uh, see what you can think. And I should just say um, from, our, from our discussions with students, um, not everybody recognizes the landmarks. These, these are some San Francisco specific landmarks. So I'll just start off noting that this, is, this right here is um, a windmill. And so we are 
um, we are in the ocean looking towards the city of San Francisco, um, right on Pacific Beach. This is Pacific Beach. This is actually the place where my, uh, I had my first date with my now wife, but that's another story. Um, uh, and this is Golden Gate Park. Um, so, the, so this is the, the basically the start of Golden Gate Park. Golden Gate Park goes away from us into the city. Um, and this is the Cliff House uh, uh, up here. And this is all the city of San Francisco. And so this is, uh, this is a, a recollection. Okay, great. So I hope you spent a little bit of time conceptualizing what you, what what feel you get from this um, from this image. What 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 impression you take away? What the artist is trying? What do you, what do you think the artist is trying to convey with this? Um, and then uh, we'll just wrap up by with a few um, examples of um, how we think about our coast. Hit this click click this uh, this link, and this will take you to our activity where we're going to do a, um, a, search and, a search activity and look at the types of things that we um, pull up when we use words like coast, sea, tide, etc. I'll just fit, f conclude today on a beginning with the discussion of um, some new thoughts that I've had over the last couple of years over teaching this class and, and working in, in the coastal zone of um, how our changing rhetoric around the coast um, has has uh, progressed. So there's actually a, a phase before this, but I just want to start by talking about the thing that everybody gets, which is what what I'm calling the California coastal imaginary or the California imaginary. And this is really this invented vision of the coast as this idyllic place, right? This place of of goodness. It's often super whitewashed. It's often pretty wealthy. Um, it's often uh, free of pr the world's problems. Um, but this really begins the modern coastal imaginary absolutely driven by Hollywood um, to a, a massive extent. And right here in Ventura County, we see these folks um, uh, on the beach filming initially silent pictures, but then, but then uh, uh, talkies, as they call them. Uh, and our coastline was transformed to all kinds of different locations, South Pacific, um, uh, uh, Arabia, all, all these different uh, uh, areas. Um, and it starts with our, with our co immediate coastal zone here. But then it really gets going in the 1960s with the, with the Gidget movies and the sort of surfing culture evolution and, and or I should say starting of the modern surfing culture um, and, and spread and all that stuff. So that sort of Gidget goes to the beach type of stuff um, was was absolutely part of the modern coastal imaginary. And we see that all over the place. So we see that Tony Stark's, uh, you know, uh, a retreat is, of course, in Malibu, of course, in the the, the Tony enclave of Malibu in, in the, uh, you know, insanely futuristic looking mansion, etc. All of that is the California imaginary. So the California imaginary is this great place, this awesome place, place of abundance, fun, all that all that type of stuff. We've seen that that rhetoric begin to be, I would argue, begin to be changed in the last many years, particularly with our natural disasters and hazards. So, um, for example, the 2015 oil spill up there, the Fuqua oil spill, um, really started in 1969 with the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. But still, um, the Refugio oil spill um, in Santa Barbara was a reminder of that, that the, that the coast is not perfect, that there's something amiss with it. Um, we scroll down to the lower right here, and these are surfers going out to surf in Ventura uh, during the Thomas fire. And one guy's got a buff on, one guy's got um, an N95 um, uh, particle mask on, which now we're all used to thanks to COVID. But, but you know, at the time, like, that's very weird to see someone walking outside with a, with a mask on just to go surfing of all things. On the, on the left there, we already saw that image uh, previously in this lecture of flooded Miami. Um, but but uh, again, that idea of this you know, beautiful city now being destroyed by the sea. Uh, or uh, 20, another example from Malibu here in 2018, um, this is Zuma Beach. And these are uh, llamas and alpacas and horses and, and all these uh, uh, larger critters that were evacuated because of the fire and they're down on the beach and this is not a filter right this is just the way things looked in this hellish hellish landscape so this notion of 
the coast is a dystopia area. And then more specifically on this later, but the middle picture there, a mask on the beach, um, COVID waste, right? So, so in fact, during COVID, we were even told by places like Los Angeles County that going to the beach in and of itself is dangerous, which wasn't. But, but you know, it, it, all of this is all of this is the coast as as science fiction danger novel, as 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 scary place, and that's different than the imaginary. So we have the imaginary. We're in, I would argue, the dystopia area right now, and we're in the process of beginning to take our first steps into what I would call the inclusionary. So the inclusionary is this next evolution, which is um, the coast, a, a real perception of the coast, but also one that includes everyone, a just vision that has everybody along. So it's not some, some uh, you know, wealthy, tanned uh, white folks uh, dallying at the beach, but it's everybody, um, working industries, um, um, uh, diverse communities, all that fantastic stuff. And this is perhaps best highlighted by the ongoing um, saga of Bruce's Beach. So so uh, more on this later, but the short version is um, uh, right here, Bruce's Beach. This is a chunk of, in the city of Manhattan Beach, a chunk of, uh, right now it's a big giant park that stretches from Highland Boulevard down to, um, basically down to the water, down to the strand, down to the sand. And this was an area that was, Originally, 1912, purchased by um, uh, Willa Bruce and her husband, um, and uh, the idea was um, uh, this was not uh, heavily occupied. Um, th this part of LA County back back in the day, back in the early 1900s, and so um, this couple bought this land and uh, turn it into essentially a, a hotel, a, a little resort thing. You can go out there, hang out for African-American folks. There weren't many folk, many places where, where our African-American community could go and uh, just, you know, recreate and let their hair down, et cetera. There's Inkwell up in Santa Monica. There's a few places, but, but not, not that many. And so the idea here was this was a um, uh, relaxing place for black folks. And, um, and they operated for about 12 years, uh, and then um, uh, and then uh, actually turned their area from just a, a resort place to actually you could begin to buy bungalows. People could be, begin to purchase units, and it was a very successful business. City of Manhattan Beach didn't like that, and they basically took it away through eminent domain, through racist practices, and basically using the excuse of eminent domain because we need this for, for a park or whatever. It was never used as intended, so the family was was uh, had their land taken away, and um, for decades it was a huge challenge in the Bruce's family with their descendants. And long story short, uh, we get to the 2000s, and there is there eventually becomes to be a, a plaque uh, put here, a historical marker, which was hugely controversial just in and of itself, and in, in the phrasing, etc. But suffice it to say. Um, uh, the plaque went in to memorialize that that's what this area was back in the day. And then just most recently, just this uh, last year and this year, um, just this last month, the, the deed was formally transferred to back to the Bruce's family's descendants. Um, and uh, now that parcel of land, we had to pass a state law. We had to pass an ordinance in, in Los Angeles County to do this, but we took public lands and we gave it back to the family. So now um, at the base of this is the lifeguard, um, the regional lifeguard headquarters for, for uh, Baywatch, the, the lifeguards there in LA County. And uh, so now instead of being on, on, on their land, now this, this park and, and the lifeguard folks are... Um, leasing the land from the Bruce's. So they are, so the stuff is still all there, but now there's a financial benefit going to the Bruce's. What they eventually do with the land is their call. Um, but it's a, an example of uh, a massive injustice that's beginning to be rectified in some of our coastal areas. Um, just beginning, I'm not trying to imply that we're done, but just beginning, we're seeing the similar thing in, in places on the East Coast, um, in, in New Orleans, um, and other coastal, uh, coastal enclaves. Um, where we're beginning to reckon with this and make a more inclusive um, place. Now, I don't want to say that that's that's it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. So, a, pro, a group that I've been, um, I, I do various things with various groups, uh, volunteer uh, throughout the year. One of them is uh, Pacoima Beautiful, which is a group that takes um, uh, folks from the, in this case, from the valley to the beach in the summertime to get everybody to the beach. Everybody, this is everybody's heritage. Let's get everybody out there and. Um, one of our one of the first trips I went on with them in 2021 to uh, Lechuza Beach, 
um, in Malibu. Uh, or no, was this Lechuza? Yeah, I think this was, yeah, this, I think this one was Lechuza. Um, anyway, it was one of the beach stops. Um, we went down there and these are mostly, um, Spanish speaking folks, um, uh, from the Valley that, that don't necessarily have, can't easily get out here on their own. They don't necessarily have cars. So, um, uh, low income, um, all that kind of stuff. And, um, brought them out here, have a fantastic time. Kids are at the beach, having, having food. Everybody's having a great old time. And we, and after we get there, this LA County sheriffs pull up, right? So they pull up and then, uh, start asking like, what's going on here? The only thing that was going on were brown skin folks were at this beach that normally is, um, very hard to get to. And, and, uh, you know, normally just sort of the wealthy residents around there are the people that are on the beach. And so someone actually called the cops because there were so many people that looked not like them at the beach, which is jacked up and messed up. Um, but, uh, another example of, of how we need to push into, um, a more inclusive vision of the coast. And we're seeing that more and more, um, even though we have a long stretch to go. So just in review, we have the, the coastal imaginary, which is the, the and, the, and these, these, these rhetorical approaches to the coast are still present. I'm not saying that they're gone, but, but the, but we start with the coastal imaginary. We're in, I would argue the dy dystopiary, and we're just beginning to to enter into this, this inclusionary. And so how these things can be, um, uh, impactful or how these things can, can impact you or me or our policies in particular, I think are illustrated here. So for example, uh, the, these rhetorical strategies are so persuasive, are so, um, so embedded that we, we can lose track of objective reality. So for example, during the pandemic, all of these, um, uh, stories were coming out and, and, you know, it seemed like every single story was how horrible we were doing, how poor we were doing with, uh, with vaccinations, how, uh, you know, we didn't know how this and that, and everything was, was so much of the media coverage that we were reading seemed very negative and very scary and very bad. Um, and in fact, some scholars, uh, took a look at this. And so they, um, looked at, um, uh, news, news, related to COVID in the U.S. and then news related to COVID outside the U.S. And what they found is that, of course, a lot of the, the media coverage, wherever we we're talking about, was negative. It was a scary time, right? We're in the middle of this pandemic. But what they found was that in the U.S., about 90% of the articles um, were, were, were bad news, were, 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 were negative, right? Whereas in the rest of the world, it was more closer to about half, so much less negative globally. So, you know, there, there are some upsides, right? Getting, getting to spend time with your family and this and that, not to be Pollyannish, but, but the point being that, that the, the rhetoric can overcome us and beca can become so successful and so reinforcing that we constrain what's possible, that we don't conceptualize all the different ways out of the maze. And so that's why thinking about these, um, these things are, uh, are really important and helpful. We need the objectivity. We don't have that objectivity. We're not going to be able to solve these crises in the wake of natural disasters or whatever. So seeing clearly is really a necessary skill if we're hoping to have a just and sustainable management of our coastal zone, whether that's in the wake of a disaster in, in Texas or Louisiana or wherever. Um, so I'll just wrap up saying there, there is another thing just to keep the, keep the language going is what I'm calling the phobiary, which is sort of the coast is a scary place that you shouldn't be in, like shouldn't even go there. And so um, most of that rhetoric is before our time. So I haven't really talked about that, but, but that would be say pre 1900s uh, uh, coastal views. So, um, so we have the, the phobiary, imaginary, dystopiary and inclusionary. And uh, that's a framework that um, I think will be helpful as we go forward through the rest of the semester talking about the coast.